I'm Jay. I started writing for a website called Hey Poor Player on September 22nd, 2012, and I did it with, you guessed it, a video game review. I was just a lad of 17 at the time, all bright-eyed and wet behind the ears and whatever other vaguely demeaning terms you've got. And in that youth, I knew I wanted to write about video games forever. I wanted to write reviews, I wanted to talk about what qualities made a game good or bad, and I wanted to be heard and seen doing it. Five and a half years later, I called it quits. The reasons were many, but core among them was a change in myself. I realized I wasn't sure about reviews anymore. It had started a long time before then, first when I looked at some of my own reviews after some time had passed and really got to thinking about a couple games I'd come to see very differently over that time. But more than that, I had gone through a lot of changes in what I considered a good or proper review to be. I'm making this video without a real argument. If I had a specific argument, a thesis, I could state it in clear terms, probably both here and at the title of the video, and then back that thesis up with supporting arguments and key points that would give it grounding and a leg to stand on. Now that, I, I have thought and still do ideally think, is what a game review should be. But you'll find people, both readers and site staff, who will tell you differently. I really don't want to tell you who's right or who's wrong, because I don't know. I'm just going to talk about what I've come to think, and what's made me think that way. It's a tough thing. When you write a game review, you want to try and hit on everything the game is doing, right and wrong alike, and you want to make sure every part gets its justice. You want to explore the game that you're talking about in a way that will really leave no stone unturned. When a game is unique and well-crafted, that's kind of easy. Maybe easy is hyperbolic, but it's a fun challenge to be met. But when you write enough reviews, you might find yourself repeating similar phrases time and time again, or describing mechanics and visual styles in nearly identical ways to each other. If you write a thousand reviews that all have to fit within a certain box, they're gonna get some severe growing pains in that box. And so will you. Right, so let's talk about the box. Publications have to put limits on their writers, and that's not sarcasm, they really do have to. My day job is in print, and there are plenty of times when I have to say that an article coming my way has to be within certain size parameters to fit around whatever other content and paid ads are on the page. Online, restrictions come too. Online, the restrictions are largely due to a little thing called SEO. For the uninitiated, SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. The name refers to the process of augmenting and influencing what's going on with a website or an individual web page, in this case a web page containing an article and the website hosting it by association. The purpose of the augmentation is to improve the number of views and clicks that the article gets, the things that gain the website enough ad revenue to net those writers a sweet $5 a month because it's basically the wild west out here. SEO has a lot to do with how easily a given web page or website will show up in search results. Basically, how Googleable it is. I don't like Googleable. You can go and read up on the details of SEO to your heart's content. I'd encourage it. I'll put a couple of good resources in the video description. Suffice to say, across just about any kind of blog, from giants like Gawker, Vox, and IGN, to smaller guys like some of my old stomping grounds, all content producing outlets are influenced by SEO. That means their content is as well. SEO influence pops up in a ton of ways, but I'll focus in on two. They're the most relevant at hand, and they're also my least favorites. One is the idea that shorter sentences are better and you should keep your number of sentences that run over, uh, let's say, 20 words, to something like a 15% minimum. The exact numbers change website to website. Right there, the rules of SEO are asking writers to compose their thoughts in a certain way. I'll be honest, and this probably comes through on video as well as anywhere, but I trend hugely towards long sentences in how I think and talk and write, and so I've bumped up against this one a lot. So, okay, that one is a good example of influence, but doesn't really destroy anything. You can work with it, I've worked around it a lot of times. The bigger and more egregious influence SEO has on content that I think really hurts the review as a whole is the idea of length limits. Now, that sounds arbitrary at first, but hear me out. I've seen it and heard it enforced at a lot of outlets that within certain restraints, shorter is better. Depending on where you look, you might find word limits at around 1,000 words, or 800, or as small as 600. The Huffington Post Complete Guide to Blogging pushes the 800 word cap. Gawkers enforce 100 to 200 word limits even. And from the perspective of a writer, sometimes that sucks. 
I first really clued in on some of this when reading and editing the writing of a friend for potential publication. This friend was pretty new to writing critique, but had a very particular way of shaping their thoughts on the page. In the case of the game they were reviewing, their tactic was to analyze the game's controls and how they behaved by going from button to button. I mean it, like every button had a paragraph. Now, you might hear that and think that it sounds like a really weird way to compose a review, and you are right in that when we say weird, what we actually mean is just atypical. The way they went about constructing their review was certainly atypical. But was it bad? I don't think so. This was someone exploring their space as a writer, and analyzing a game in a way particular to what they had noticed the most, and how they were thinking about the game in their spare time. That's part of what critique of a game should be, I think, is something where the personality of the writer isn't denied, but rather comes through in the way their argument is constructed. If I hear you talk about a game you like, and I know something about you, I will understand the way you thought about that game in a fashion that will enhance my own understanding, and probably my understanding of you, in turn. If my friend wanted to go through the game button by button, they should have been allowed to, because that process in itself informs a lot about what in the game stuck with them the most, and I guarantee there would be some readers who would see that and be refreshed and grateful by that approach. The reason so many distinct personalities and writing styles get audiences is because there's audiences for those different writing styles. Instead, I had to tell my friend to compress all of that into a single paragraph so that they would have time to get to 10 other parts of the game within an 800 word review. The demands of SEO and the requirements imposed by writing a complete review kept my friend from talking about the game in the way they really wanted to. And I can definitely admit that I've done that kind of thing to myself, too. Some of my early reviews got to around 2,000 words in length or more. Now, is that daunting to read? Yes, yes, it is, sure. I won't deny that it can be daunting to make one's way through something that expansive. But in those early reviews, we hadn't started thinking about SEO yet, and I was not held down by specific length constraints. If some aspect of a game stood out to me enough that I had to take some time aside to focus on it and it alone, then so be it. I had agency over my own viewpoint to a degree that writers from many sites do not have. When we lose some of that agency, we lose some of the nuance of our critique, which in turn weakens the critique. Ever heard the 7.8 too much water joke? Of course you have, you're on the internet. That jab at Callie Plagy's review of Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire for IGN is a lazy and unfair joke, but it highlights something important. Her criticism was that the layout of the game's setting was not enjoyable to explore. If that thesis seemed summed up in a rushed manner, it could very well be that having more freedom to explore that element of the game would have driven her point home more and allowed both her and IGN as a whole to avoid some negativity to boot. Jonathan Dornbush's Spider-Man review got turned into a meme within days because god damn. The game really just makes you feel like Spider-Man. Neither of these examples are ones I bring in with any proof of length constraints having been a problem. I've never spoken to either writer nor anyone else at IGN who could have confirmed or denied. My point is that both reviews beg the question of what requirements or constraints on the part of the website may have impacted the critique. All of this, though, is really only one part of a big issue. If you look at the discourse over game reviews and what the people who read them want them to be, you'll see a lot of conversations break down like this. Party A, often a majority of them among readers and not writers, claim that there is enduring bias in game reviews. They point at examples where a reviewer will talk about things that worked in a game and why those things were evocative to the reviewer and they will claim those feelings go too far into the evaluation. They want more straight facts and descriptions of what the games reviewed are doing. Essentially, they want reviews to be less critique and more Wikipedia pages. Party B, often among current or former writers rather than readers, will hit right back by making a comparison much like I just did, trying to explain why what the other side wants might be dry, boring, soulless. For Party B, the personal reasons are an essential part of the review, not overtaking critical analysis, but rather enhancing it when used correctly. So what? what's with this, what do we do with this, how do we solve this? I don't know. But looking at the problem, looking at that discourse, it really makes one think about the positioning that reviews and reviewers have. Neither party A or B is invalid for what they want. Party A wants to make sure that what they read about a game will inform them enough to make an educated decision on whether it's worth their money. 
Party B wants to make sure the soul and nuance aren't further sucked from reviews than constraints and SEO concerns on many websites already cause. To my eyes, that all begs two complementary questions. One, are the desires of Party A reflective of what reviews should be? Two, will the desires of Party B be better served if not stuffed into the box of what reviews currently are? If we organize game reviews to satisfy Party A, reviews become even more cookie cutter than I've talked about them already becoming. Within that theory, if you were to take the same game and look up its reviews on 10 different websites, you would ideally find the exact same scores and commentary across all of them. Personally, I find the idea of this depressing and discouraging. Why should I spend my time writing a laundry list of the things what the game does and not be allowed to talk about why those things are effective? What you're doing there is eliminating discourse between critics. You're just saying that they all have to agree all the time. Part of the fear that Party A is acting on comes from reviews being biased, and it's understandable. I think we've all been guilty of happening upon critique of a game and thinking, how the hell do they think that about that? Of course, when we do that, and this is important, we are ourselves speaking based on our own bias. I can't believe it, writes a lifelong Halo fan on a middling Halo 5 review written by someone who just isn't as entrenched in the fandom on it. So if Party A is looking for reviews that nobody will ever disagree with, again, they're looking for descriptions and not critique. Back in February of 2017, I reviewed Night in the Woods, a game I very much enjoyed and which spoke to me deeply on a personal level. I thought the game itself was a really well-created piece of art in terms of adventure and storytelling, and in my review, I tried to make it a point to connect my own personal background to that, to say, hey, I've gone through these experiences and they connect me to this game in these ways. Meanwhile, Justin McElroy was writing a review of the same game for Polygon that, when I read it, I found really interesting. In it, he hits on all the same things working in the game that most criticisms did, but makes the point that his background caused him to see the main character of the game very differently than I did. I had seen a character who I related to in terms of depression consuming one's life and distorting the way one sees their surroundings, but Justin made the point that, as a father and someone who had lived through a little more of life, his instinct was sometimes to see that same character as irresponsible and generally kind of hard to like. Are either of us wrong? We both reviewed the game and evaluated its merits on their own value, its faults on their own value, but also both explained, not just wrote, but actually explained, the ways in which our own lives influenced how we saw and connected to the game's story and characters. Is that bias? Because I don't think it is. When a writer does something like that, interjects not just what they think, but why they think it, those who read the review in question and who have a similar life experience can go, oh, maybe this will also be a positive experience for me, and add it to their reasons to play or not play the game. If they are from a completely different background, it's still helpful to know if something relates to them. But all of this, the personal viewpoints, the time spent on the things that stand out to one reviewer versus another, all of it is what some voices say game reviews need less of. And I guess I'm starting to feel that maybe the key relies more on putting less reliance on what game reviews currently are, making them, in their current form, less important. When we consider reviews to be everything, the consensus becomes more important than the actual discourse for a lot of people. Look most recently at the couple of reviews Red Dead Redemption 2 has gotten that score it as anything less than perfection. Look at their comments sections, see what they get. Breath of the Wild last year was another good example, when Jim Sterling's review rated the game a 7 out of 10, a lot of people bashed the man himself and his general attitudes more than they gave actual credence to his criticisms of the game. That's not healthy discourse. That's letting a number inform more than the review it's attached to. Review scores are miles more arbitrary than they get credit for, too. Every website that publishes scored game reviews has some sort of unified metric for what a given score means. On just about any publication you visit, you can find an explanation of those scores for the public to read. I actually wrote the first one that Hey Poor Player used, so having others to consider was a great help to me at the time. Review scores are their own can of worms that could easily be another video, but it felt worth mentioning. Alright, I'm going to bring it back to my original point, or rather, original uncertainty. When I look at the constraints put on reviewers for writing for websites with quotas to fill, when I look at the way some readers seem to feel about game reviews and what deserves to go into them, 
when I look at how much less there is to say about a game if you systematically ban perspective from the conversation. When I look at how easy it is for entire nuanced reviews to be simplified by readers and subjected to a mob mentality, it makes me wonder why the hell we're still doing this if it's clearly not hitting the mark anymore. These days, more and more people who want to get an idea of what to expect in a game go to streamers and YouTubers to get a slice of the experience. The idea of using a written review to inform whether a game is for you is falling out of favor, not in a vacuum, but because there are other less constricted ways that people can get that information. You can read or watch an 800 word review or two, or you can watch a stream or video of hands-on, moment-to-moment gameplay, or find an independent content creator's lengthy analysis. If there are very particular things you want to know about a game, go out and find your answers in content specialized for them. Let people write about and talk about games from the angles they want to. Don't ditch truthfulness, but maybe do ditch this idea of an arbitrary checklist and range of topics that everything covering a game has to follow. Find what kills the nuance and kill the killing thing instead. Let's get an analysis about precisely why Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire have too much water and what that means. Let's talk more in depth about why Insomniac's latest game makes you feel like Spider-Man. I'm not saying critique doesn't have a place, I think we'd be pretty lost without it and I still aspire towards it in some respects. But we need to stop treating critique like it's the same as a should you buy video. That Night in the Woods review I mentioned earlier was one of two things I wrote on the topic of that game. The other one was an article about how and why that game spoke to me as I was at the time, the lessons it gave me that helped me through a very difficult time in my life. I'll let you take a guess at which of the two pieces I'm more proud of, and which I think has more value. I guess if I were to have a thesis to this, it would be that the real reason I stopped writing reviews is that I don't believe in them anymore. We're moving past them as they currently are, and the people still creating them very often get shafted for it. So let's branch out. Let's get more and more experimental and specific in how we talk about these increasingly varied pieces of art, and stop acting like they can be neatly fit into the same evaluative box that's not how real critique works or how real discourse works. I can dock points from Night in the Woods because it has a couple annoying segments that drag, or I can praise it because it helped me actualize my depression. One of those things sounds worth talking about a lot more than the other. I've been Jay. Thanks for watching.